Um, my name is Bart Stinchcomb, and this is our record shop on Cannon Street here in Chestertown, Maryland. Um, we, uh, we probably, I think we've got about 900 square feet, and probably 898 of it <laughs> is used up uh, with records in it so far. And we carry up, you know, everything from Brazilian records to Indian records to you know, Leonard Skinner and the new Pearl Jam or the new Taylor Swift and everything in between. Steady going up. Yeah. And it, it seems like, I, I've been in the business a long time, and it seems like this trend has gone on for over 15 years now. Like it's just been steadily gaining traction, going up, more records are being pressed, more new artists or newer artists are putting their stuff on vinyl, and then stuff from the last 50 or 60 years is being repressed. A lot of reissue programs by jazz labels and and you know all kinds of labels. <laughs> so. you, the old debate about sound quality being better in vinyl. You, do you buy into that? Yeah, I, I do. Talk a little bit. About that. Whenever that question gets asked, I always go back to what Neil Young said about twenty years ago. That to him, analog was like a spray of warm water and digital was like ice cubes. And I don't, you know, agree with that as an all-encompassing statement, but it's something to kind of feed off of, and it just, you know, it depends. I mean, they've come a long way with digital music, and some vinyl doesn't sound that great, but most of it does. And with vinyl, there's, you know, it's what pressing is it, and then with the reissues, who reissued it? Were they careful? Did they use the original tapes to make it? Was it from a digital source? You know, there's That's a... That's interesting. So you're, we're talking about collectors now, too, then. You know, right. People are looking for a specific pressing of a, book, of a uh, record? Quite a few, yeah. I have some folks who will come in, and they'll only buy new reissues because they don't want to mess with used stuff. Other folks come in, they don't want to touch new reissues. They want the original or at least a second pressing or something like that. And it just all depends on the wants, the needs, or the mentality of, you know, who's buying it. So what brought you here? Have you been, to you've been doing this before? I to said. Chestertown? <laughs> Realtor.com brought, brought us here. I grew up in Annapolis. So I knew about the Eastern Shore, but uh, long and short is we were living in the mountains outside of Boulder. And we wanted to get out of the wind, or at least Christina did, my wife, uh, so that she could do more work with her ever-growing uh, love of horses. And so we bought a horse farm here about eight and a half years ago. And at that point I said, you know, don't worry, there won't be any more record stores. We're not going to do any more of that. We've done that for 30 years. And after a couple of years I got the itch. and. Uh, Michael Hotson, who has the listening room down the street, offered me his front room to sell records in. So I did it there for a couple of years and then moved up here when we ran out of space and Mike ran out of space. So. You know, this is a common thing for people my age to say, I guess, but Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. I mean, I was a little kid. My brother was nine years older than me, so he knew what was going on. I didn't really, but I knew that something was happening. And he was getting into music and buying records. Our uncle actually worked at a radio station in Annapolis, and he would bring home um, 45s that they were no longer, you know, it was just dig through them, play them in my grandmother's parlor, as we called it, uh, not living room. Uh, and then it just went from there. You know, I'd get a little allowance every week, and I'd give it to my brother because he had a driver's license, and he'd bring me 45s that I asked for that I'd heard on the radio. And my grandmother, uh, growing up in the house in Annapolis, she was good friends with Hoppy Adams, who was a um, DJ at WANN, which was a black station. And that music was played constantly in our house. And it really, both my brother and I have a deep appreciation for soul and rhythm and blues and stuff like that, old doo-wop music. So did you just start saving the records? Is that how this... Yeah, collecting, I guess, is the word. <laughs> yeah, and it's still going on. My brother's 75. He calls me every week to tell me the new stuff he got. I'm very active in uh, collecting still. I, did. I, I got in with some characters in 86. We bought a record store that these guys were done with. They wanted to sell. 
So I got in with those guys for four years. I kind of called it my college because anything I didn't know about music, I learned there along with some other things. But, um, and then in 90, I broke out on my own and opened my first shop and had that all the, uh, some incarnation of that all the way up to 2015 when we moved here. And I sold it to a friend who still carries it on there. And growing up in Annapolis, it was mostly Meriwether Post Pavilion and the Capitol Center, or Baltimore Civic Center. Um, and then, of course, living in Boulder all those years, there were uh, Red Rocks was an often visited place for concerts. Uh, in 2009, you know, we were talking about concert experiences and some that have s stood out. In 2009, I saw Taylor Swift at Cheyenne Frontier Days. And, you know, guys my age are like, eh, whatever, you know. And it, she burned it to the ground. And, I mean, obviously she wasn't nearly as popular as she is now, but she was popular. And it, I was impressed. It was just the whole stage show, the band, her, everything. It was, it was unbelievable. And now that's common knowledge, whether you're a fan or, or not. Could you see it coming? N with her? Yeah. No. I didn't. All I knew was that she was uh, somebody my daughter liked at that time. So we went up and said, yeah, let's go. It'll be fun. What other concerts stand out in your mind? Well, the one that really stands out in my mind is 1972. I'm 13. My friend Ricky is 12. And I go to stay at my grandmother's house in Annapolis, which was three miles from my parents' house. And I said, hey, Ricky, have you ever heard of Richie Havens? He goes, no. I said, well, he played at Woodstock a couple years ago. He goes, oh. I said, he's down at the Naval Academy tonight. So we went down to the Naval Academy. Neither Ricky or I had a dime in our pocket. I didn't even know how it worked, you know. <laughs> so I got there and the midshipman goes, uh, three bucks for tickets. And I said, oh, we, we've only got like two dollars. And he goes, ah, just go in. So we, I thought I was going to get in trouble, you know. I didn't even know what I was doing. So we went in and it was his electric tour. He had a full band. I mean, he often toured by himself over the years, but this was a full electric band. And we're an hour before the concert, and the guys setting up the stage are like, you guys want to come up? I was like, yeah. Well, we didn't, not only came up on the stage, we sat on the 12 and 13 year old sat on the stage for the entire concert. <laughs> it never got better. <laughs> There's a lot of great concerts after that, but it never got better. I don't really sell online. Um, just as a rule, particularly with the used stuff, because I want my customers who come in here and support us to see that stuff. Not someone I've never met. Um, and uh, it's steadily, I'm starting to pull people from Dover and Middletown, Annapolis, Baltimore even, that are finding out about the shop. Um, so some people are casual and some people are real serious. They'll spend two hours in here and comb the entire place. You know, Some will just come to get the two records they know they want.